What is up guys? It's an exciting day. We're going to review some of my favorite possession movies. Did you guys hear that? Am I am I losing my mind? Let's just let's just start the video. What is up guys? Uh, I've been having a lot of fun doing these top 10s and my last one I did was for sci-fi horror and I got a few requests down uh, down below in the comments to do my top 10 favorite possession movies. And so that got me excited actually because uh, as, as much as I don't like a lot of possession movies, there are some really great ones out there. Um, and so I'm looking forward to doing this. I actually put together my list and everything and then I reached out to Killer Flicks and I asked them to give me like their top three possession movies. And I'm going to read a few of those for you right before I uh, answer number one. And also, before I get into this, if you'll see, I'm wearing kind of a modified F Off Wade t-shirt uh, over at my spread shirt. I have a, an F Off Wade t-shirt. It's a little bit different than this one. I kind of redesigned it, uh, redesigned the Killer Flicks logo on there. And I put uh, F Off Wade uh, behind his head. So if you want to get one of these, be sure to go over to the Drum Dumb spread shirt and uh, buy you one there. We kind of have a big love affair with uh, the Wade character from Halloween 4 over at Killer Flicks. Anyway, let's jump into it. And I'm going to give you one honorable mention, and that would be Jennifer's Body. Uh, and I didn't realize that this is a possession movie, but when you really think about it, I guess it kind of is, because her body is taken over by this demon. One thing I really like about this movie, too, aside from it just being a horror movie, is the writing by Diablo Cody in this, who, who was uh, the writer for Juno. Uh, I thought she did an excellent job with this. When you can elevate characters in a movie and make them really funny and relatable and, you know, quirky and quippy and all that, then that's just a leg up. And I thought uh, the characters in this movie were really infectious, actually. And, you know, leading this thing was Amanda Seyfried and Megan Fox. They both, I think they worked very well together. And there's some creepy moments in this movie, too, actually. And this is one of those possession movies that doesn't hold back in the uh, blood and guts department. And a lot of times, especially these days, they usually opt to not show blood in these movies, uh, or the supernatural movies. You tend to just see the jump scares with the CGI creature. But no, not this one. Okay, let's get into the countdown. Number 10 is going to be the Amityville remake. I'm not the biggest fan of the original Amityville. I've tried to watch it a few times. Um, there are a lot of 70s movies that hold up and they're not that dated. This isn't one of them for me. The remake, on the other hand, is really good. And I, and I enjoyed Ryan Reynolds' performance in this, how he slowly descended into madness in the house. And I've always been interested in the Amityville house as it is. So I think this one, and I believe this was a Platinum Dudes production, but uh, I think this one's actually highly underrated. Number nine is Insidious. James Wan is today's best working horror director. I'm gonna say that right now. And Insidious could have been like every cookie cutter, possession, supernatural movie, but no, it offers a few extra ideas and it has his directing to boot. But I like how it explored these ideas of like the further and you know, this kid, he goes into this coma in the movie. And so you have all these tortured souls in the further and so there's a lot of variety there with the characters you know and one can't not mention the red faced demon i call him like the darth maul character but that is a character that is so interesting and i want like a full-on movie with the red faced demon number eight a john carpenter classic christine most of the time we see uh, people being possessed in movies but it's cool when you have a car that's possessed uh, this is based off stephen king's novel of course and you have John Carpenter's perfect directing to boot. John Carpenter had his heyday in the 80s and the 70s. Uh, he's not as great of a director now. He just doesn't direct that much anymore. You know, he did The Ward. But this was when he was in, you know, his heyday. This was when he was at his best. And I just love those 80s high school movies anyway. And this takes place with some characters that are in high school. And this one kid, he falls in love with his car pretty much. He like becomes obsessed with Christine. And Christine causes a lot of damage throughout this movie. And it's just such a unique horror movie, you know, very irresistible. Hell, Stephen King took the idea further with Maximum Overdrive later. Number seven, Paranormal Activity. I don't like found footage movies very much at all, but every now and then one of them sticks out. And the first one was very effective and very successful. It dethroned the Blair Witch Project as the most successful uh, independent film of all time. 
And it's one of those movies, like most found footage movies, where it is a little bit tedious in the beginning. Uh, they're setting things up. But the big scare in the last act is so effective. And when you can put an effective scare in a found footage movie, that just makes it even more terrifying because it just pumps up the realism. And I will say, of the last decade, Paranormal Activity has one of the most effective scares of the bunch. Number six, another James Wan movie, The Conjuring. I mean, this is the movie that started it all with this whole Conjuring universe. And, and it's just genius to me that you have a horror universe out there. That's just so cool. But it started with this movie, The Conjuring, which is based on a true story about this, this house that was haunted and this family moved in there. That, by the way, they lived in there for 10 years. But all these ghostly happenings were going on throughout the movie. And it has one of those signature scares in it too with the, the clap. That was just genius marketing on their part to do that trailer and have that little clap there. I mean, if you can scare an audience in a trailer, then that's, that's pretty damn cool. But the movie itself is, is pretty good, actually. It, I'd say it's probably the best out of all the Conjuring Universe movies. It still hasn't been topped. It's one of the few movies since The Exorcist that has that type of character and scare, you know, where the demon takes over the, the body of a person. And, you know, it looks like what you get in the end of the movie, which was very similar to what you saw in The Exorcist. But it worked in The Conjuring, because there's been so many movies that tried to copy The Exorcist and failed miserably. Number five, let's have some fun, Night of the Demons. I love this freaking movie so much. I saw it for the first time, I believe like two years ago. And it takes place on Halloween night. You got this group of uh, teenagers and they go to this haunted house to have a party. And one by one, they all become demons. And so what's cool about this movie too is it kind of flips itself. It starts off with the victims and then one by one, they become demons. And so... The, the demons become more and the victims become less. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a slasher movie. It, it's a unique premise, actually. But the big thing, too, about this movie is it's just so fun. It has that 80s flavor to it. Uh, the characters are just infectious. Lania Quigley, need I say more? You know, she has that iconic lipstick scene. And it's one of those movies that I have to throw in every October. Number four, another John Carpenter classic, Prince of Darkness. I'll say this right now, Prince of Darkness, John Carpenter's most underrated movie. Most underrated score, even. I love this feeling of dread throughout this whole movie. And this is not the only John Carpenter movie to do that. This is the second part of his Apocalypse trilogy. And I tell you, I love this movie immensely. It just, just how unique the plot is. I think Carpenter wrote this even. It's a very ambitious plot, you know. What if Satan tried to take over Earth via this, like, green ooze? And throughout the movie, the ooze takes over the people. Kind of like what the Thing does, you know. So, this has a, a very Thing vibe to it. The characters become possessed and they want to kill each other. It's the very definition of a good versus evil movie. Evil trying to creep in through the back door. And I like that whole anti-God subplot where the anti-God is like even more powerful than Satan himself. You know, Carpenter got pretty ambitious with this one. Number three, the original Evil Dead. I've said 1981 is like the greatest year of horror. Evil Dead's just another reason why. What Sam Raimi was able to do on an evidently minuscule budget throughout this movie. It's a testament to young filmmakers. Look at Evil Dead. If you're wanting to, to make your own film, Sam Raimi did it with Evil Dead and he created, still to this day, one of the scariest movies of all time. And sometimes I think when you're forced to be even more creative, the end result uh, can be even better. But Raimi created his own filming style with the camera rushing toward the cabin in the woods. And this movie has like some, some controversial scenes too with the, you know, a character being raped by a tree, which is a scene that Raimi uh, admitted later that he regretted doing. And it introduced Ash Williams. Now, this isn't the Ash Williams that we get in Evil Dead 2, but he's still great in this movie. You know, and it kind of introduced that idea of a final guy. Number two is Rosemary's Baby. I think this movie is the definition of, like, brilliant A-level cinema. This is a big movie, an ambitious movie, and it really focuses on this character, this woman, who is just being completely controlled throughout her whole life uh, because she's giving birth to the devil. It's a possession movie because the devil uh, possesses the child. 
And so throughout the movie, she has these members of this cult, and they're trying to control her to make sure that the devil is born without any issues. And I remember putting this on my top 10 hidden meanings in horror video because one of the hidden meanings about this movie is the treatment of women. How Rosemary, like I said, has no control throughout this whole movie. Every move that she makes throughout this movie is not of her own free will. And throughout the movie, you feel bad for her. You know, you want her to, to succeed. You want her to know what you know, pretty much. But can't not mention Polanski's masterful direction in this movie, too. The, the amazing score. I really love, like, 60s horror films. Even to this day, they still have their own unique vibe to them. And I think Rosemary's Baby really embodies that. Now, before we go to number one, I'm going to read you just a couple from uh, Killer Flicks. And I thought about putting Sinister on here, and I asked the question on Killer Flicks, would you consider Sinister a uh, possession movie? Some said yes, some said no. But anyway, the, the, the few that I'm going to read here, Daniel Patrick Glenn, he said, is Nightmare Part 2 considered a possession movie? Actually, I guess it could be because Freddy takes over Jesse's body. So that kind of blows my mind. Uh, next one is from one of the Killer Flicks mods, actually. Uh, Mia Palazzola. She says, I hope I said your last name right, Mia. She says, hmm, I don't think I'd consider it one because I think the boogeyman is just a presence that has a paranormal-like uh, luring effect that manipulates them but not necessarily possesses them if that made any damn sense it did make sense her top three are evil dead 2013 oculus great one right there and the possession ironically enough i have not seen the possession but i saw the possession mentioned quite a few times in here so it sparked my interest i think i'm gonna actually watch that one and then i'm gonna read you one more Stephen Jeff Burdett says, Exorcist Conjuring 2, he chose the Conjuring 2 over Conjuring, which is a good one, and Exorcist 3, which is another one I constantly hear is great, and I've never seen the third Exorcist. And he says, does Child's Play count? I guess sort of, because um, Charles Lee Ray possesses the doll, Chucky. And then here's one, Jason Goes to Hell. That blew my mind, because yeah, that is a possession movie. Uh, Jason possesses different bodies throughout the movie, so... Really good picks there, guys. Then number one, no surprise here, The Exorcist. This still, to this day, is the scariest movie of all time. It will never be topped in my mind. There are images in this movie that will make you shudder, that uh, will make you lose a lot of sleep. And it's a controversial movie still to this day. I mean, the idea of this 12-year-old child saying the things that she does, looking the way that she does in this movie, it's startling. It's crazy to me that a movie that's uh, over 40 years old, coming on 50 years old, is still so controversial and bold to this day. Could we even make The Exorcist today and make it as crazy as it is? Maybe. But in 73, this movie pissed a lot of people off. There were people literally running out of the theater, reports of people vomiting in the theater. Uh, and how often do you hear of horror movies actually doing that to people? Maybe three, four times in your entire life, that's The Exorcist. So anyway, guys, that is my top 10 favorite possession movies. I'm sure I missed some. Let me know in the comments which ones I missed. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks, where we talk horror all day and every day. And on Fridays, we do Free for Fridays. Follow me at Drum Drums on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, and Drum Drums.